Hello, my name is Dr. Melanie Bourgeau. I'm currently a fourth year pathology resident at Emory University and soon to be soft tissue fellow at the University of Colorado. Before I get started, I just want to take a moment to apologize for the long delay in posting any new videos. I recently got married and took board exams, and believe it or not, those are two very time intensive processes. But now that things have calmed down, I'm looking forward to posting videos more regularly. So in this video, I'll be discussing three spindle cell tumors in soft tissue pathology that I think are important for new residents to know. As with my previous videos, if you want to look at the cases beforehand, I've included links to the digital slides in the video description. Let's start things off with one of my favorites. This is a slow-growing soft tissue mass near the knee in a 46-year-old male. At low power, this tumor is composed of two distinct areas. One that is more blue and cellular, the other more pink and hypocellular. The more cellular areas are composed of spindle cells in a world testicular arrangement. However, the most striking feature is how they tend to clump up or line up with alternating areas of acellular collagen. Moving to higher power, there is some variability in the size of these spindle cells and a little bit of the shape. Some are a little larger and plumper, while others are smaller and thinner but they all have the same nuclear features, which is this powdery chromatin and central punctate nucleolus. You can also appreciate in many of these cells that they are tapered on one end. For instance, this end is more tapered and this end is more blunt. Moving to the more hypocellular areas, these same cells are present, but they're being dissected by this extracellular edematous thixoid material. Also in these areas are dilated, thin-walled vessels with this pink homogenous rim, which is called hyalinization. Lastly, if we move to an area of more, let's say, dramatic cystic change, we can see that sometimes there is a significant inflammatory infiltrate as well as significant hemorrhage and hemosiderin. And the hemosiderin tells you that the hemorrhage is real and not artifactual. Last but not least, and you can see this especially in these type of areas, we have scattered cells that look a little bit weird. For instance, there are some nuclear pseudo-inclusions, as well as cells that are enlarged with these smudgy, degenerative appearing nuclei. This is an example of a schwannoma a benign peripheral nerve sheath tumor that arises in the superficial soft tissues, most commonly the head and neck and extremities, but can also be seen in visceral locations as well as the CNS. The key feature of schwannomas are the mix of cellular Antony A areas and hypocellular degenerative Antony B areas. However, the most classic feature are the presence of varicae bodies, which are the areas of palisading shown here. Now that you've seen a classic example of schwannoma, I'm going to share some interesting variants I've come across during residency. This example, if you can't already tell from low power, is composed predominantly of Antony A areas, and varicae bodies can be seen throughout. Sometimes, varicae bodies can be so prominent they form what I like to call zebra stripes. I tend to see this pattern more frequently in CNS schwannomas. Cellular schwannomas are an important variant to recognize since these have a largely fascicular arrangement and usually lack obvious nuclear palisading. I've heard different opinions on diagnosing these, but in general, these features should be diffusely present. This can matter clinically because cellular schwannomas are more likely to occur, especially if incompletely excised. Since I've given a lot of attention to more cellular examples, now I'll show some cases with interesting degenerative features. This schwannoma has prominent hyalinization, which makes it look like someone took a marker and outlined all the Antony A areas. This example has prominent myxoid change, and what's interesting is that it appears to involve the Antony A areas replacing the collagen in the varicate bodies. One variant I unfortunately don't have a great example of is epithelioid schwannoma, and these really do not look like schwannomas to me. They look like something balanocytic. 
The closest example I have is a schwannoma with small round cell morphology. You can still appreciate some subtle palisading or clumping together, but out of context you could also call this growth nested or maybe corded, and that's the sort of pattern you see in epithelioid schwannomas. One more thing about epithelioid schwannomas is that about 40% are SMARC-B1 deficient and demonstrate loss of INI1 on immunohistochemistry. This is also seen in about 70% of epithelioid malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Although most epithelioid schwannomas are clinically and morphologically benign, a few atypical reported cases suggest that these entities represent two ends of a spectrum. All right, I promise I'm done sharing schwannomas, at least for this video, so we'll move on to the next case. This is a deep soft tissue mass arising in the thigh of a 40-year-old female. At low power, the lesion is composed of admixed pink and blue areas, giving the tumor a bit of a marbled appearance. The pink areas represent areas of fibrosis, which is variable throughout the lesion. Some areas, like this, are hypocellular with dense, almost hyalinized collagen, while others have more delicate, wispy collagen. Taking a look at the cells themselves, this tumor is composed of small, bland, uniform spindle cells with no real nuclear tibia. They are arranged in a fascicular to story form to vaguely world growth. Moving to a more mixoid area, you can see that the same type of cells are present, although this area is relatively more cellular. A characteristic feature of these areas is the rich vascular network, which is accentuated by just a little bit of perivascular collagen, which you can see right here. This is an example of a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma, a deceptively bland translocation-associated sarcoma commonly presenting in younger adults as a slow-growing mass in the deep soft tissue of the proximal extremities and trunk. Historically, these were misdiagnosed as benign fibromas, but this was called into question when patients presented years, even decades later, with local recurrences. Even though the name is a bit of a mouthful, I actually like it because it tells you exactly what you're going to get. Low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma demonstrates strong diffuse positivity for MUC4 by immunohistochemistry, which can be helpful on smaller biopsies. The majority of cases have a characteristic gene fusion between FUS on chromosome 16 and CREB3L2 on chromosome 7. The minority of cases have a FUS-CREB3L1 fusion. Here's an interesting but clinically insignificant morphologic variant of low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma previously called hyalinizing spindle cell tumor with giant rosettes. I'm having issues viewing the digital slide right now, but here are some screenshots I took. As you can see, the name is very descriptive, which I like. There can also be morphologic overlap between low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma and sclerosing epithelioid fibrosarcoma. Although hybrid cases exist, it is more likely to see a case of sclerosing epithelioid fibrosarcoma with a minor low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma component. In addition, pure sclerosine epithelioid fibrosarcoma usually has translocations involving EWSR1 and CREB, either CREB3L1, 3L2, or 3L3. I don't have an example to show, but classically these tumors have a uniformly dense collagenous to hyalinized stroma, and the cells are more rounded than spindled. It looks a bit like this area right here. Sclerosine epithelioid fibrosarcoma arises in a slightly older patient population than low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma and has a more aggressive clinical course. One last thing before we move on. The difference between low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma and myxofibrosarcoma low-grade can be confusing to newer trainees, since it feels like they both are the same terms, just in a different order. However, these two entities can be easily distinguished morphologically. The cells in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma are uniform and bland, which is common in translocation-associated tumors. In contrast, all grades of myxofibrosarcoma are composed of pleomorphic, spindled, and multinucleated cells, with hyperchromatic nuclei and dense eosinophilic cytoplasm. 
In addition, a low-grade myxofibrosarcoma is much less cellular than a low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma. The level of cellularity seen in low-grade fibromyxoid sarcoma would be equivalent to a intermediate to high-grade myxofibrosarcoma. To give you an example, this is a case of myxofibrosarcoma high-grade. As you can see, this is very clearly malignant. I'll cover this entity a bit more in a later video. Now for the third and final case. This is a mass on the wrist of a 30-year-old male. At low power, we can see that this is a multinodular lesion located in the deep soft tissue. Fibrosis is seen both between and within the nodules and ranges from dense to more thin and wiry. Areas of hemorrhage can also be seen. The nodules themselves are composed of tight, hypercellular fascicles of uniform, plump, spindled cells. Although the cells themselves are not particularly atypical, the marked hypercellularity along with mitotic activity is concerning. This is an example of a synovial sarcoma, a high-grade translocation-associated sarcoma that classically occurs in young adults in the deep soft tissue of the extremities, often near the joints, with the knee being the most common site. Historically, it was thought to arise from synovium due to its tendency to occur near joints. However, this has since been disproven, and the true cell of origin remains unknown. Synovial sarcoma is defined by a recurrent translocation between chromosomes X and 18, resulting in the fusion of SS18 with SSX1, 2, or 4. Immunohistochemistry is nonspecific, and there are plenty of pitfalls that I don't have time to go over because this video is long enough. There are some emerging immunohistochemical stains targeting the SS18 SS fusion, but molecular methods remain the gold standard. If you want to learn more, I've included links to some recent papers in the video description. Clinically, this is an aggressive tumor, and distant metastases occur in about half of cases, with the lungs being the most common site. Here is an example of a lung metastasis in a different patient. In this case, the herringbone pattern is very striking. However, I must caution you that this is not unique to synovial sarcoma, and this pattern can be seen in other high-grade sarcomas. For example, this is a leiomyosarcoma, also metastatic to the lung. I remember when I saw this, I was so sure this was a synovial sarcoma, and I was really surprised when I read the history. Another high-grade sarcoma that can enter the differential is malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. This case has rhabdomyoblastic differentiation, so it isn't the best example. But if you ignore all the big eyeball cells, you see the same pattern of tight hypercellular fascicles you saw in synovial sarcoma and leiomyosarcoma. Infrequently in synovial sarcoma, there can be extensive degenerative changes, including cystic change, hemorrhage, fibrosis, and calcifications, especially if the patient received neoadjuvant therapy. Here is an example of a post-treatment synovial sarcoma where the calcifications are especially extensive. So far, I've only shown the most common type of synovial sarcoma, monophasic synovial sarcoma and I am truly sad that I do not have an example of biphasic synovial sarcoma to show. As the name suggests, this type of synovial sarcoma also has a glandular component, which can range from focal to extensive, with rare cases mimicking an adenocarcinoma. And that's all I have for now. Thanks for watching, and please like and subscribe. I promise you won't have to wait as long for the next video.